stomped on their face with a hobnail boot and broke their nose. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 100 Sanford Podcast. We are back in the building. It's your guy, Lamar Lovelace. I am here with G. Foss. Foss, what's going on today? Man, I can't call it, man. Uh, Daddy and... Uh, by the, by, by, the, by the way, the dogs still undefeated. You know what I'm saying? They ain't lost in a long, they ain't lost in a very long time. Bro, it's gonna be a long time before we say <laughs> that they that they have like, a look, long, like, long, long time. Yeah, I ain't mad at it, but she's she's <laughs> look, look, the schedule. People talking about our schedule. Hey, man, we play who on the schedule, bro? Yeah, you gotta play who's in front of you. Play who in front of you. Like there was a time yeah. where there was a time when you seen. Tennessee and Florida on the schedule, and you mm-hmm. was like, oh, I don't know if they're gonna beat them. That's that's what that's <laughs> that's what I, that's what all the na- naysayers would say. You know what right. I mean? So listen, we still playing who's on the schedule, and it is what it is. You know that's what it is, man. That's what it is. You know, I mean? you know I, it's funny because I had a, I had a chance to hook up with uh, Jim Caldwell. You know, coach the Lions back in the day. Yeah, uh, still NFL coach, and I was talking to him before the uh, Texans played the um, played the uh, I think who they play? Oh, they were playing the Colts at that time, mm-hmm. and he was a an assistant with the Colts, and you know he's a frat brother of mine. So I was like, hey man, you got to take it easy on the on the Texans today. And he looked at me, he said, "Mar, ain't nothing easy in this league. Guarantee you, anybody can reach up and bite you." You know, so in that game, that the, the Texans actually ended up beating the Colts. It was an outrageous game, but. It goes to show you that any week and, you know, anything can happen. But, you know, it just goes to show you, too, how much them dogs is doing what the dogs is doing. Because when you're still undefeated, even though ain't no games being played right now, we know that, folks. Yes, sir. We're it's still, still a thing to... where still, you you know, they're still undefeated. It's, right. It's, it's a tough game. Yeah. Tough game. And we're and we trying to figure out our team, man. What's going yeah, on man. with the, you know, what's going on with the QBs and whatnot, man. That's the hot button topic with Georgia right now. You know, yeah, I mean, we got we got the QB, the QB uh, battle. You know what I mean? Ongoing, right? Ongoing, from what I from what I hear. You know, yeah, what I mean? you know, so I, we, I like, we don't I really like, know like what's to, really happening. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I like to see for myself. So, you know what I mean? We'll we'll see. We get we get the coach speak and and all that good stuff. <laughs> but um, you know, I guess we're gonna have to wait to to G Day to see for ourselves. You know, yeah, man, we got G Day coming up in a couple weeks, man. Um, I think it's I think it's a scr- I think it's a scrimmage coming up too uh, this Saturday. So we'll see. We we'll probably get some new news uh, for this Saturday. I wish I could Facts. go, but um, I got volleyball again. So, but, uh, well, we did get some news on it. Um, we got some news that some guys are out. Uh, Michael, uh, Michael Williams is out with a foot injury, so he's shut down for the you know for the remainder of the spring. We got mm-hmm. Kendall Milton who's shut down for the remainder of the spring. Um, you know, precautionary things with Mikel Williams. It's actually a, a, a foot surgery he's going to have have done, mm-hmm. but he'll be ready for fall camp. Um, okay. But some of these other guys have been shut down. Jalen uh, Walker, uh, Marvin Jones Jr. They've all been shut down. So, okay. you know, it's spring. You want these guys to be healthy when the, when the bullets really start okay. flying, so to speak. But it also gives an opportunity for some of these young guys to step up and get an opportunity right. to showcase what they have, get some reps. You know, mm-hmm. people are excited to see Damon William, uh, Wilson, Samuel and Pemba. You know, he's a mm-hmm. big monster coming out of I had, 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 had to meet some of those guys. I had a chance to meet some of those guys at uh, at Pro Day, some of those freshmen. You know, how they look I, to you. Uh, you size they, them up. You let them know. They, they look the part. You know, I had to let them know that, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, now if you come up that age. You to be trifled with. I might, I might have to put hands on you. <laughs> no, nah, I'm on no smoke. I don't know. I'm on no smoke with it. It was them five star kids. I don't want no smoke. One of the kids, uh, Snelling. You know, I played with his dad. I mean, um, I played with his dad, Paul Snelling. He was like, "When were you at George?" I was. Like, I told him when I was there. He was like, "You, yeah. he was like, you know, my dad, Paul Snelling." I said, "Boy, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I am old." 
That's funny, man. Yeah, you know, when you start looking up and people start saying, yeah, I played with your dad, I played with your uncle, your, you know, whatever it may be, it's like, man, whew. then you start reaching, you know, looking back and saying, man, some years have passed. But, uh, but yeah, man, you know, we got a couple weeks before that. Uh, hopefully uh, the offense can get in tune. You know, right now it's under Bobo. Todd Munkin's moved on. And so I think people are going to be excited here in the next couple weeks just to kind of get their eyes on on what the offense may or may not look like. Um, not too much right. is going to be shown because it is on TV. They're not going to give away too much. It's like last year's mm-hmm. G-Day under Todd Munkin. You know, you didn't know what to see or what, what you were going to see during the season because they weren't running the ball that much. They weren't trying to get their running backs real banged up and there was no exotic looks that they were really doing. But just to see the quarterbacks, I think that's what everybody wants to see, the quarterbacks mm-hmm. and the new wide receiving core with Ra Ra Thomas and Dominic Lovett, you know, those guys stepping in. And actually also the the, uh, the tight end room without, uh, you know, our boy moving on to the NFL. It's mm-hmm. just going to be, you know, it's the, well, it's the best in the game. I mean, we got the best in the game still in the building, but I think people want to see – they wanted to see um, – what's his name? Pierce Sperlin, you know, him and Delp and, and what they have – yeah, and Lucky, the depth that they have in the tight end room because we've gotten so used to 12 personnel now. We want to see if those guys can continue doing what they do from the, from the, um, from the tight end room. But it's going to be interesting. You know, we got a couple Man, of weeks I, out, like I said, so – I read I read something. I believe it was on Dog Central. Shout out to Dog Central. Yes, sir. Uh, and they say love it out there cutting up. <laughs> <laughs> Route running, man. They you say can't, you there, know. They out there cutting up, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> like separate from everything, catching everything. You know, they say he's looking like a first round draft pick. You know, well he looked good I, against us, right? I could dig it. <laughs> All right, I he looked good it. against Georgia this past year, man. And and you know what? Iron sharpens iron, right? So I, I like it. I like it that he's out there. Rob Rob Thomas is out there. I mean, we already had um, Lad McConkey out there doing his thing. Yep. But, but when you got receivers that can force your DBs to play to a different level, it only makes those guys better. And so when the you know again when the bullets start flying, these guys aren't shell shocked by what they see across from them. They they've already been prepared, especially when you got size, you got speed, you got power, you got, you know, extreme route running what these guys can do. It's gonna be interesting. And uh and also, you know, we forget some of the young guys that we still got Arian Smith mm-hmm. that can fly. You know, you got fly. Right, Anthony Evans, a, a freshman who they said is also cutting up a little bit with speed and, and his cutting ability. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to force a lot, a lot of these DBs to step up, and that's another battle too. I mean, you, you lose Ringo, that's a yeah. position that has to be filled. Uh, you whether it's going to be you got Nyla, yeah, uh, and you Nyla got, Green, uh, Everett, you got a, yep, AJ Harris, Harris, the freshman who's who's, who's balling out. They said so. the old the OG uh, Lassiter. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the safeties are going to be good, man. I I feel good about the defense overall, man. It could get ugly <laughs> again. It could, it could, <laughs> again, it could, it could get it could get really <laughs> ugly, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just you know, the same boy constricted defense, man. Just choking people out. And hopefully you know it mean? does. You know, I mean, hopefully it allows these quarterbacks to get a little comfortable early on. Um, the offensive line to kind of get comfortable with themselves because you do lose two starters on the offensive line. You got to replace those guys. So it allows those guys to kind of get comfortable in, in the pocket. I mean, you know, again, we don't even know what the offense is going to look like. We had Stetson back there who was able to escape different things. They were able to roll him out. They were able to allow him to do some bootlegs, things like that to get comfortable. These guys aren't the same. Carson Beck is not the type of guy that's going to, you know, <laughs> He's going to run for a 70-yard touchdown. A Brock Vandergriff, maybe. You know, mm-hmm. uh, Gunnar Stockton, we know that he can do that. That's what he does, and that's what he did in high school. So, But whoever takes the helm of that of that ship and, and tries to lead us to a three-peat, they're going to have their, you know, their hands full. And, and, and having a defense that's able to keep them in games or keep them comfortable to execute the way that they're supposed to, it'll help out more towards the middle of the season when you start – Playing some of the bigger name teams that we have on the uh, on the schedule, but um, hey, before we get into anything, we have a special guest that's coming on tonight. Uh, Amy Trask, she will be in the building. Um, it is Women's History Month, and we wanted to make sure that we showed our appreciation for the lovely ladies out there to do so much in sports, in life, and everything in general. 
I mean, think about it. these guys. I, what did you do when you cross? You know, you got a chance. You got your name called or anything like that in the NFL. Did you say thanks, mom, or did you say hey, dad? <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Everybody always says thanks, mom. You know, yeah. The ladies so, are important, and they're getting they're yeah. having more and more of a role in the game of football, uh, which is you know. You know you know, typically have been a male dominated sport, but the women are getting their due. They're yeah. they're gonna be parts of the game, even down to on the field with coaching and uh, officiating and right. also up in the front office as our uh our guest tonight has did so for nearly thirty years um with mm-hmm. the Oakland Raiders. And so yeah. um it's I'm I'm glad that she agreed to come on, you know I, I I shot my shot, and he <laughs> said she gonna kick it with Lamar and Big Faust, you know, yeah, for man. a little while. And it's good. And she gives she gives great interviews. I've watched I've watched interviews of her before, and uh, she's just um, she just seems like a you know a swell lady. You know what I mean? If 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 if, if that's the way um, that I should put it. Uh, seems like a swell lady. Does does really good with the interviews, and uh, she just keeps it real, man. She's yeah. a straight shooter, up front, straight shooter, and um, I'm just um, you know, looking forward to hearing, you know, just some stories, man. You know, I know I know Lamar. Lamar does his his research, and you know he probably <laughs> has some stories to ask. Uh, listen, I'm a Bronco. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I went toe to toe, head to head with her, her squad many a time, man. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, man. When you start talking about the Oakland Raiders, you're talking about you know one of those teams that d- helps define the NFL. I think a lot of people have forgotten who they are over the over the last few years. You know, especially with them having the ups and downs with coaching and the team not performing as well, moving to Las Vegas, but when you talk about the headway that this team made in structuring the NFL, when you got Al Davis and the things that he did to to actually promote the game and move the game to a whole nother level, the Raiders mean a lot to the NFL. And, I, and I'm, a, I'm a traditionalist, man. I, I like when teams, the traditional teams are winning. You know, you got the Steelers, you got the Kansas City Chiefs, you got uh, the Cowboys, but the Raiders are one of those teams that I always hope they're winning, you know what I mean? Because they mean that much. And, you know, when I was growing up, I wouldn't, go that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, I wouldn't go that far. I feel like when the Raiders win. I think the Raiders, <laughs> I, will, I tell you what I will give the Raiders, though. And the Broncos nation, you know, don't hate me for this. I mm-hmm. think the Raiders got, I think the Raiders got the best uniforms in the game. You know, they're cold. They're black, they're they're cold. black and they're black and silver. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's consistent. You know, mm-hmm. and then and then you know, with that silver helmet, it just looks like doom. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it look it looked like they mean business. Now I've beat them more times than I've lost to them, but still, mm-hmm. it's, it looked like look, look, look like they mean business. You know what I mean? It's always and it was always fun to play out there too, man. That's that is a rowdy, rowdy, rowdy situation. Well, o- okay, so were were they in <laughs> Oakland or were they in Los Angeles when you played them? It was Oakland. It was Oakland. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I heard yeah, going that, into Oakland was a nightmare. Hole. Oh man, that black hole over in that corner of the end zone It's real mm-hmm. deal now. They be yeah. they look like it look like Halloween every Sunday. You know? Yeah, they they People. said, man, you can't you can't send family members over there. You know, they got a family section. You better be well protected because those folks get wild out there in Oakland. You pull in there, pull in there with, with the bus, and, like, they already ready. They double fist in the Hennessy <laughs> at uh, 10 in the morning, <laughs> 11 in the morning. <laughs> like, you pull in there, you know, on that bus, they yeah. ready. They ready to go. And even, even uh, I got a chance to get up close to them, you know, the fans and whatnot. During my later years, when I was uh, scouting, mm-hmm. and uh, the Raiders were one of my teams, and uh, I had to, you know, park in the parking lot and just walk through the tailgates and stuff. Man, mm-hmm. they be out there getting it. They be out there, <laughs> it's, it's, it looks like a good, a good old time, man. Good old time. Yeah, man. I, there's some teams that you don't want to go into their stadium and play, man. I think Philly is one of those teams. Um, the Raiders. Um, I would probably say 
even Baltimore, they said, used to be like that. Baltimore's not the same. Pittsburgh used to be. Now it's becoming more of a corporate crowd. But but there's some yeah. stadiums, man, you, you you just do not want to go in. And I heard Oakland was just a, a nightmare. I had a friend, that frat brother, who uh, his cousin played for the play, – he played for the Broncos, maybe. I got to remember his name, but he played for the Broncos, and they went to they went to a game in a black hole, man. And he said he was sitting there protecting his sister the whole time because they were ready to beat him up and her up because they had Broncos gear on. But uh, <laughs> but um, I, I always uh, I always uh, admired the people that would be there with the Broncos stuff on. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah, like, Y'all brave, <laughs> y'all brave. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot of heart. To be able to do that, to actually come in there and, and, and play in Oakland and so forth, man. But um, I think our guest is arriving. We're going to make sure that we have her connected. I Are think you, you do. Can oh, you my me? goodness. Yay. Yes, we hear you. The one and only. Foss, I'm going to let you do the honor because, you know, you have that NFL pedigree and you always give these eloquent introductions <laughs> to our guests. So I'm going to let you do the honor, sir. Listen, y'all. <laughs> it's, when, it's Women's History Month. We have one of the more important women in the area of sports, definitely in football, a pioneer in the sport for women. Uh, she uh, she was the great Al Davis's right hand person, woman. Uh, she just meant a lot to the game. And I'm saying this as a former Bronco, <laughs> and you know it. You know, and it, and it doesn't really pain me to say this about a, a Raider. Uh, she uh, she's done her thing in the game. She continues to do her thing in sports. We'll get into the other stuff. Um, I'd like to introduce our guest for this evening, Miss Amy Trask. <laughs> well, that was an overwhelmingly nice introduction. I am honored to join you. I am thrilled to join you. And, you know, let's put to rest this whole Bronco Raider thing in the following <laughs> regard. We were um, rivals on the field on game day. The Broncos and the Raiders wanted nothing more than to destroy one another. Oh, man. But, um, but boy, oh, boy, I had a tremendous working relationship with Pat Bolin, who was, of course, the owner for the Broncos for many years. And okay, he made a significant right. he made a significant difference in my career. But I I would be remiss if I did not mention the time we were in Denver to play the Broncos. We're leaving the field and the fans start throwing snowballs oh. <laughs> at our players. Now, I'm walking off the field right next to Lincoln Kennedy, one of our Ooh. offensive linemen. And as you know, Lincoln <laughs> is not a small man. No. Well, the fans are throwing snowballs at Lincoln, and Lincoln starts up into the stands. He's really angry because these snowballs have ice in them, and they're hitting him in the face, and they're hitting our players, and they're hitting our training staff and our equipment staff. Well, Lincoln starts going into the stands to, you know, take on the fans. And what do I think? <laughs> All five foot three of me? I'm going in to protect Lincoln. I am going in there, and I am going to have Lincoln's back, and I am going to protect Lincoln Kennedy. Now, mind you, at my height in flat shoes, I probably maybe on a good day come up to Lincoln's hip or waist, but I went in there to protect him. And then all of our guys on the sideline are like, Amy, get out of there. Amy, get – I'm like, no, 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 I got Lincoln. I got Lincoln. So we did get out of there. Um, and a snowball fight aside, what a tremendous, tremendous rivalry. Let, let me ask you that. Was that uh, – did y'all happen to win that game? I think we did. Was it the one that Langston Walker blocked the field goal? That Boy, my... that I don't remember. But I do remember Langston blocking the field goal. I mean, oh, God, yes. I remember Langston blocking the field goal. There was a one game I lost to the Raiders in my whole career. I was do you so want to talk mad. about it a little more? And, and, want, want to really was, go and, into that? And, and, it was, and, and it was snowing. That's why I asked. Cause it, <laughs> it, it definitely was snowing. And, well, uh, what, about, I, I, what about – I'm sorry, go ahead. 
And so I'd imagine that, you know, being sore losers in the in the stands, they probably would throw snowballs. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, and I am sorry okay. I interrupted you, but I got so excited when you mentioned a snowy game. Remember the one? <laughs> Here we go. Just all these fun little memories. I think it was Ronald Curry in the back of the end zone. Grabbed yes, that, it was that, that was the game. That was the game. It was, it was that game. So- I don't remember if that was a snowball game, but oh boy, oh boy, I remember that Ronald Curry catch and Joe Ellis, yep. someone else with whom I had a tremendous, tremendous working relationship. <laughs> Every year at Joe Christmas Ellis. time, he would make me a Christmas card that had like a picture of Ro- that Ronald Curry and he'd send in a like, I'm still not over that, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, like Ronald Curry had a great game that uh, that day. I remember, uh, I remember, I, I really remember that game for Ronald Curry going off, Langston blocking that kick. Uh, uh, I was friends. I was, you know, I was friends with Ray Buchanan, so I had a chance to. He got a uh, somebody got an interception. Might have been Ray, and I had a chance to, you know, go tackle him or push him out of bounds and stuff. It was a lot going on that game. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, as to the point about we 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 were ferocious rivals on game day. Um, I Definitely. remember the season that we beat you guys um, in LA in the final game of the season, and then we had to beat you again the next week in a wild card, and we did. Um, but you know, rivals, <laughs> just for my time. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Um, but I really did have a phenomenal working relationship with Pat Bowen, and he did something very very special during my career that was that was meaningful and. Um, he reached out to me at a league meeting. He saw that I was um, working to try to see if I could resolve the dispute between the league and Al and the league and the Raiders in that lawsuit. And when he realized what I was working to do, he offered me his help. And he said, I see what you're trying to do there. You're trying to resolve all these disputes. How can I help you? And that just always stuck with me. So yes, rivals on the field. Um, and I went in that stand to go protect Lincoln, but um, you know, colleagues on non-game days. Well, Amy, I think that he brought that up because I think George was the one that really threw that that snowball. That's what I think. I think he started it. Quite honestly, <laughs> he might have. You know, now that you mentioned it, he might have. I would not. I would not. I would not do that to the well loved princess of darkness. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, hey, let's let, let's kind of get into this, George, because I mean, she's she's already. I mean, she's ready. She's lathered up. I can't wait to get into to this interview further and further. But we gotta we gotta kind of go back, Miss Trask. How did you get involved with the Oakland Raiders? I think our fans really don't know your history and how much you meant to the NFL, to the game, and to what ladies are involved in the game to this day. So, how did you get involved in in the NFL? Well, thank you very much for that. That was very, very generous and gracious of you. Uh, I fell in love with the game of football when I was in junior high. I went to my very, very first football game in person in the seventh grade because back in the day when I went to junior high, it started in seventh grade. And um, I just fell in love with the game. It's, you know, people look at it and it's a game. It's, it's, it, they look at the physical game, the speed, the power, the force. But it's also a very cerebral game, as you guys know. It's a game of matchups. How does our pass protection match up against your pass rush? Can our corners cover your speedy receivers? How are our backs going to work with your linebackers? It's a very, very intellectual game. I liken it to a game of chess with very strong, very powerful, very fast chess pieces. So I fell in love with the game of football. Didn't really have a favorite team until I went to college at Cal Berkeley, at which time the Raiders were right down the road. And I just fell in love with everything about the team. You would turn on games and you'd watch visiting teams on the road, get out of the team bus, and you know, they'd all be wearing sport coats and carrying briefcases. And then you'd see the Raider team bus drive up (laughs) on road games and the door would open and everyone would just fall out looking like they were wearing what they were wearing the night before. (laughs) And you know, it was a team where the owner Al Davis gave second and third chances to players who had not been given other chances or other teams wouldn't give them second or third chances. Heck, sometimes he gave them more chances than that. And he gave chances to people who were labeled behavior problems. And that really resonated with me because men in kindergarten, I was labeled a behavior problem. And that (laughs) label stuck with me on every report card through 12th grade. Some people would say it's still appropriate. But I love that he didn't care if you were a behavior problem. He just cared if you were going to help the organization. So when I came back to Los Angeles where I grew up, 
after college, I came back to go to grad school. And that was the same year that Al moved the team um, to Los Angeles. He had tried moving it a couple years ago, but been ordered back to Oakland by a court order in a lawsuit. So I graduate Berkeley and come home to Los Angeles. My favorite team comes down to Los Angeles at the same time. So in grad school, I, I kept hearing all these kids that were a year or two ahead of me talking about internships and externships. I didn't know what the hell, I'd never heard of an externship before, but I picked up the phone, I cold called and I said, I'd like to be an intern. The receptionist patched me through to someone. I learned later it was Al Locasal, Al's, Al Davis's right-hand man. And I said, I'd like to be an intern. And he said, what's an intern? And I told him what I would do. And he said, okay, come down. And that was it. And I became an intern for the team. And I, you know, I, I would have done absolutely anything. It didn't matter to me what my responsibilities were. My responsibilities could have been picking up the scrunched up Gatorade cups on the sideline. And I would have been thrilled. And I'd have been the best scrunched up cup picker upper there was. I would have worked so hard at that. Man. Wow. And, and, then, and, and so, and that turned into what, 30 years? <laughs> yeah, almost. So um, when I finished my internship after about a year and a half or two, there was no job opening. So I graduated grad school, took a job. And about a year into my job, I get a phone call from the organization, from Jeff Beeren in the organization, who said, we have an opening. Um, and before we interview other people, we want to offer the job to you. Men, wow. I ran so fast to give <laughs> notice at the place where I was working that if Al had seen how fast I was running, he would have hired me not as an employee, but to play corner. Um, and I joined the organization full time in 87. And as I said, if you combine my internship with my, um, my full time work there, it was almost 30 years. You know, he, he's been he's meant so much to the game. Um, and we were talking about this before you got on. I don't think people realize the impact that Al Davis made on football and the Raider organization. What did he mean to your career personally? Because obviously you had your legal career, but what did he bring to you that elevated you as a person and as an executive as you would, you know, eventually become? Everything. I mean, he afforded me the opportunity of the lifetime. And for those of your listeners, um, I guess some people listen to you. Some people will watch you on video. No, I guess they'll just listen. I'm, I'm kind of getting into this whole podcast thing. But um, there will be some people listening who love the Raiders and loved Al Davis. There will be some people listening who hate the Raiders and couldn't stand Al. But if everyone is being intellectually honest, they will acknowledge that he did decades and decades and decades before it was even a topic of conversation throughout the NFL, that which is being discussed now. Um, he, look, there, there are people listening to your podcast that weren't born when I started my career. And it kind of mm -hmm. makes me want to cry to say that. Uh, <laughs> but I started my career in the, well, I was an intern in the early-ish part of the 80s, and I started full-time in the mid-80s. And, you know, there was no discussion at that time about women in the NFL, women in football, women in sports. He hired me without regard to my gender. And um, I owe my career that I have had and that I have now to the opportunity he gave me. He hired without regard to race, gender, ethnicity, or any other individuality which has absolutely no bearing on whether one can do a job. He hired Tom Flores, he hired Art Shell, he hired me. He did not care about those individualities in the sense that he recognized they have no bearing on whether one can do a job. You, you know, can I follow up something on that, Amy? Because I mean, right now, you know, there's there's a limited amount of minorities in coaching in the front office. We are now seeing more and more ladies actually get, uh, you know, better opportunities in terms of officials, coaches, executives, and so forth. If Al was around right now, would we be much further ahead or would the game still be lagging where it's at right now, in your personal opinion, before we get to some other questions? You know, that's a great question because he was doing – decades and decades before others were doing what we're seeing more of now. And, you know, um, I, I, do, I, I do know what his reaction would be if he was listening to this conversation because there were many times I said to him, you hired Tom, you hired Art, you hired me, and I don't think you get the credit you deserve 
for hiring in the inclusive manner you do. And he would always sit, snap back, and I mean it, that in a positive sense. Hey, I don't want any credit for it. I didn't do it for credit. I did it because it's the right thing to do. And he said it, he said it more, more beautifully than I just uh, did. But his <laughs> point was he did not want to be given credit for doing the right thing. So do I believe he would have continued to be a leader in this regard? Yes, I do. Um, do I think he would share the view I hold, which I'll share with you now? Yes, I do. You know, I'm asked all the time when there is a woman who is, you know, ad- hired within the NFL, advanced within the NFL, am I excited? And my answer is sure. But what is going to be truly exciting is that when people are hired without regard to race or gender or ethnicity, and it's no longer newsworthy. You know, and if I may, I'll take a moment to share a scene from my favorite movie, which while most people think it's Animal House, and I do love Animal House, (laughs) it's actually Apollo 13. And there's a scene where the character played by Ed Harris walks into a room and sitting around a table are NASA engineers. And Ed Harris' character dumps onto the table bolts and pieces and parts and equipment, and he says to them, with only these pieces and parts, you need to figure out how to get those men back to Earth alive because those were the only pieces and parts they had on Apollo 13. Do you think anyone on Apollo 13 gave a damn what the race or the gender or the ethnicity no. of anyone sitting around that table was. No, right. they no, just no, no. wanted, they just wanted to get home alive and they did. And you know, that's the way Al hired without regard to those individualities, which have no bearing on whether one can do a job. Well, it is you going a job, different direction. The biggest question. Can you yeah, do a job? Yeah. It should be that simple. And, yeah. and, you know, it's funny because, you know, our questioning is now going a different direction, but I'm going to follow it up again with this. H- how how can it be done? Um, you know, we hear these these terms collusion. We hear, you know, this guy doesn't want to hire this person. We hear about the Rooney Rule. I'm a Pittsburgh fan, by the way, so that's, uh, you know, here nor, here nor there when it comes to the Raiders. But how does the hiring become more equal? Do you have a thought or suggestion on that? Boy, I wish I did, but let me take one minute and tell you Dan Rooney was magnificent to me from the day I walked into my... I'm going to answer your question. I'm not avoiding but I want to tell you, I walked into that first NFL owners meeting. I was the only woman in the room. I joined the organization at a time when, as I mentioned earlier, the league and the Raiders were involved in a dispute. And by the way, I will say this every time I discuss this from now and forever, and I sound like a five-year-old when I do, they started it. We didn't sue them. They started it, mom. Okay. They, you know, they started it, but we were involved in this dispute and notwithstanding that it was pretty contentious litigation meeting. Number one, only woman in the room, Dan Rooney was one of the first team owners to walk over to me and offer me his support and his encouragement. And so people ask me all the time, am I bothered that it was labeled the Rooney rule? And the answer is no, I'm not bothered at all. I did say to Al at the time, shouldn't this be the Al Davis rule? And I again got the, Hey, Young lady, I don't want a rule named after me. You you know, it's fine that it's named after Dan. I don't know the answer to your question. I wish I knew the answer to your question. How do you compel people to do what's right? If we could figure out a way to convince people to do the right thing, we would be able to solve a lot of problems. I do think um, one thing that's important is something we are seeing teams do right now, which is open up pipelines, form pipelines and open up pipelines. You don't wake up one day and just say, "Ah, I'm going to be the CEO today or I'm going to be the head coach today. You have to work your way into those positions. So we do see clubs now opening or creating pipelines so people can grow within the organization. And that's a good step. But, you know, we just need more and more and more and more of that. I know this. If I own a team, I would hire the very, very, very best people there were without regard to anything we have discussed. And that's how it should be. That's exactly how it should be. What do you think, uh, we get back to, back to uh, you and your relationship with Al. Like what's, like when, when you get to, when you get, when you dig deep and you listen to other people talk about Al, you kind of 
you kind of get a sense that the way he is is a little bit different from the way that he's portrayed. There are probably some, you know, truths of how he's portrayed, but what 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 do you what do you think is the biggest issue with with how people portrayed Al and and That's what the reality question. is? I love that question. It's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, the biggest misconception about Al is that he wouldn't tolerate disagreement and he wouldn't tolerate those who disagreed with him. If that were the case, I would have been fired roughly two and a half weeks into my job. <laughs> um, I, I was sitting in an office with a coworker. Al walked in. He starts ripping into this man. I mean, ripping into him. The analogy I always use is, I imagine it's kind of like the way a velociraptor would rip into flesh. And after listening to him for go on for a little bit, I realized he was wrong. So, um, look, I don't have a dainty voice, you know, in most instances, but he was speaking loudly. So I was speaking even more loudly than usual to, to make sure I was heard. And so I said, excuse me, in a louder voice than I'm using now, you're wrong. And his head, I will never forget the expression on his face when his head turned and looked at me. And I said, he was looking at me like, what? And so I said again, you're wrong. If the facts or the data upon which you were basing your conclusion was accurate, then your conclusion would be fair. But you are basing your conclusion on inaccurate information, inaccurate data, and you're wrong. Well, he yelled, I yelled, he yelled. And I don't mean yelled in like a personal sense, but we were having a very, very heated debate and we were raising our voice. I didn't learn until much later that it was so loud that people throughout the organization gathered in the hallway outside this office in which we were <laughs> having this discussion. And one woman even brought some boxes figuring, oh, we're going to have to help her pack up. She's only been here two weeks. She's gone. Well, quite a while into this back and forth, back and forth, he all of a sudden stopped and he looked at me and he said, oh, I got it. I gotcha. I got it. And we went right on and we finished the conversation very nicely and very conversationally. And that was, as I said, roughly two, two and a half weeks into my employment. And I understood from that moment on that all these rumors and, and this legend about him not tolerating disagree, uh, tolerating argument or, or difference of opinion or disagreement were incorrect. Um, you did not need to be a yes man or a yes person. But if you were going to disagree, bring your data. Bring, you know, don't disagree just to disagree. Come with an argument. Come with your data and prove to him um, that he's wrong. And, and that's what I did. And I will tell you that over the course of almost 30 years, I disagreed with him more than I agreed with him. And I felt it was my job when I believed he was wrong to try to convince him he was wrong. But if I was unable to do so, which happened many, many times, I had to recognize he owned the business. I did not. Mm. And so once he made the decision, it was my job to effectuate it to the best of my ability and also not to run around whispering, I didn't want this. I didn't want this. Nothing drove me more nutty than that. When an organization makes a decision, it's the decision of the organization. When the, you know, look, quarterback makes an audible and calls a play. It's your job on the offense to effectuate that play to the best of your ability, whether you think the play call was right or not. You're not going to sit there and look over, you know, the left tackle is not going to look at the left guard and say, well, I didn't like this play. I didn't like this. Play. You're going to try to win. You're going to try to run the play to the best of your ability. Yep. Because your job you know, still depends on it, whether you like it or not. Right. <laughs> and you got to, you got to execute that bad idea to the best of your ability. <laughs> well, that's right. And by the way, if I owned the team, then I would get to make the decision. Mm hmm. Exactly. You know, Amy, then, what was, you know, Al had a huge influence, right? And we're talking about Al, but what was your, inf your influence on Al? What was your influence and your, I guess, your thumbprint on the organization as you were CEO of that organization? Well, I worked on things that were behind the scenes, if you will. In other words, not um, evident to the public for the most part. There's one thing I did that was very evident and one thing that still swells my heart when I think about it. But, you know, to put it in the starkest terms, I kept us afloat. We were not a high revenue club. 
Um, there were times where it was, you know, Al would commit to spending some money and then he, you know, whether it was to sign a player or multiple players or to um, sign a coach or spend money. And, and he'd call me in the office and say, tell me the deal he made and say, you got to go find the money. Beg your pardon? <laughs> yeah, go find the money. <laughs> so, um, you know, I handled all of the banking and all of the finance and, and literally kept the team afloat and operational. And at one point, I said to him during my career, it was a very, very, very tense moment from a financial standpoint. And I said to him, I don't know how you sleep at night. And he said to me, and I'll just always remember these words and the tone in which he said it, I sleep at night because I know you don't. In other words, he knew I was worrying about it and I was going to find a way to fix it. Um, so, you know, that's that's an example of one thing I, I worked on. Um I don't, you know, I don't know that you want want others, but there were things that I worked on that were just sort of out of the line of sight of the public, and they were what I would call very, you know, sort of to a businessy um, and yeah, most very very touching understand. exchanges with Al like that. Yeah, most people don't understand what it, what all goes behind the scenes of a football franchise. Like there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Like yep. people see, people see contracts of these players. Like there's, there's a, there's a person that's, that that's all they do <laughs> is figure out yep. how we're going to pay this person. You know what it, I mean? Yep. That's their and, there's, job. and there's taxes and there's financial mm -hmm. compliance and there's reporting. And I will tell you this, you have to do umpteen audits a year because the league requires audits and there's player association audits. I may be the one person with whom you will ever speak on your podcast that loves audits. I love <laughs> audits. I used to drive our finance department nuts when I would say, yippee, we're getting audited again. Because <laughs> audits keep, <laughs> no, seriously, audits, it's, it's like a health check. Audits keep a business honest. You're, you, I love outside audits. So, so and that let, just knowing all of that, that leads me to ask, so your, your background college-wise was, in essentially law, correct? I studied and, and, you know, I'm a big believer that when you go to college, you just go to learn and you don't have to, in all instances, focus on what it is you might end up doing. I studied political science and I okay. focused, um, I focused quite a bit, boy, is this relevant now in our world today? The sociology of voting behavior was something I studied. Hmm. And um, I studied a, a lot of uh, other political issues. I took some prison reform classes, went to San Quentin to learn about that. I'd, I had just a very wide, I was going to say I had a very wide, broad-based education, except I stayed away from the math department. <laughs> uh, so, how did you get, so how did you get into handling the numbers for the Raiders? <laughs> you, you must have been just pretty smart overall. Well, you should have seen Al's face the first time he walked in my office and saw me counting on my fingers. He looked at me like, <laughs> such a look of horror on his face, like, oh my gosh, she's in charge of our money and she's counting on her fingers. <laughs> you make sure you have good people in your finance department. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Awesome. You know, what was, uh, you know, you talk about the influence that you had. But what was like one of the most challenging situations that you ever had as CEO, especially with, I'm not going to say a bullseye on your back, but really a spotlight on you because you are the only female executive in the NFL at that point. What was one of the most challenging things that you ever had to deal with? You know what? I never spent a minute thinking about my gender. I'm sure there were challenges that I had. They were business challenges. They were securing lines of credit. They were dealing with finances. They were dealing with, you know, selling limited partnership interests of the team, dealing with municipal disputes, things of that nature. But I never viewed that from the perspective of being the only woman in the room. Um, it never made sense to me, still doesn't, that I should want to go into a meeting, whether that was with municipal leaders or team owners or other, you know, owners of other teams or other owners, you know, partial minority owners of the Raiders or a banking meeting, a locker room meeting, a meeting with coaches, any sort of meeting with the expectation and the hope that nobody would be thinking about the fact that I was a woman if I was there thinking about the fact that I was a woman. That just seemed to me to be a waste of my time and my energy. If someone else wanted to worry about the fact that I was a woman, go ahead, waste your time. I'm not going to waste my time. You know, as to your question, I was asked, you know, I've been asked quite a bit, 
was I tested because of my gender? Was I tested because I was a woman? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, I don't know, but I think it's fair to assume I was. People are tested all the time. People are tested because of their race, their gender, their age, their seniority, their educational background. People are tested all the time. Well, what's the best answer when you're tested? Pass it. Pass the damn test. So whether I was tested or not wasn't of interest to me. Where I focused my energy was getting the job done. Right, right. Well, since you have gone on, the Raiders have moved on from Oakland to Las Vegas. And it never, you know, it's always boggled my mind why they kept moving from Oakland to L.A., back to Oakland. Why have they never been able to maintain that consistent, I guess, home? In Oakland, I, I feel like they're the Oakland yeah. Raiders, but Las Vegas Raiders just does not roll off my tongue. Why are right. they in Oakland? <laughs> um, when, uh, you know, I'm, I'm on a, a CBS Sports Network television show every Sunday morning, and when the Raiders first moved to Las Vegas and when the Chargers moved up to Los Angeles, if I had to put a quarter in a jar for every time on television, I still called them Oakland or I still called them San Diego, um, that would be a very full jar. Uh, the, the reason that the team moved was to get the, you know, a, a new stadium, the likes of which they got. And, um, you know, people ask me all the time, what do you think about the move? And the answer is, it's an absolutely beautiful stadium. It's a magnificent stadium. And I don't think it's mutually inconsistent for me to have two views. For the fans that are thrilled with the move and love the stadium and are following the team to Las Vegas and remaining fans. And by following, I mean, maybe they go to a game, but continue to follow the team, even though it moved, they've remained fans. I'm thrilled for them. And for the fans in the Bay area who are heartbroken, well, I'm heartbroken for them because they're going through this for the second time with the team moving. So I don't think it's mutually inconsistent to say I'm happy for the fans that are happy and I'm heartbroken for the fans who are heartbroken. When you think, I never thought about it until just now. When you think about the history of the Raiders and what they mean to the NFL, and just they're 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 one of the flagship teams. You when you think about it, and you put in the terms of them being a flagship team, you may not the old school fan may not think think it's cool, but they kind of deserve, and I hate them saying this, they kind of <laughs> deserve the fancy smashy. It doesn't go with, it doesn't go with the, 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 when you think of Raiders and the grit and the ragtag bunch and like you said, the outcasts, it doesn't go with that, but like being a flagship team, uh, I, I feel like they probably should have a nice stadium because I've played, i I can't lie to you, Amy. Uh, <laughs> I've played now. I'm sure the uh, the home team had bet- way better accommodations, but I've been there as a as a guest, and that Oakland boy. You're not. You're not <laughs> suggesting that you didn't care for the locker room that had no hot water. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it was wires hanging out the ceiling. By the way, I've got news for you. I got but, but, news but, for you. The home I team locker room wasn't much better. <laughs> Let me tell you about you. you you're going to remember this name, uh, Jim Coletto. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, he coached me in Detroit, but um, I remember him from his Raiders days. And, uh, and uh, one thing he said, we were talking in the locker room one day, or maybe at the lunch table, and he said, You know what? Everything you've ever heard about Oakland and the Raiders, mm-hmm. it's true. <laughs> he said the good, the bad, the ugly. He said everything you've ever heard is true. And uh, he's, and I think he might have been one of the people that told me, or well, somebody said that 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 raggedy visitors locker room was by design. <laughs> they wanted you, well, I wanted will, you, I will they wanted you as uncomfortable as possible. Well, and, and that's a job. little bit of a wives' tale because the home team <laughs> locker room wasn't much better. A um, little better, not much better, but I used to let, like, sometimes it was just no hot water. And, you know, the, oh, gosh, I remember, like, there was so many times the, um, sort of my counterpart at the team, 
that was playing us in Oakland would come up to me, you know, Amy, what the heck? Only it wasn't what the heck. It was what the <laughs> something else. Like, you, you know, no hot water. Um, you know, and, yeah. oh, there were so, and, and by the way, the, 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 the area where we watch, you know, stuff at halftime, it's leaking. And, and I'm like, what do you want me to do? You know, go down there. I'll, I, I will go down there with a wrench. I'm on it. So um, I, I did try that a couple of times. <laughs> did you ever get, did you ever get to, you know, I, I know, you know, did you ever get the the fan fan experience in in that stadium? Oh, um, I spent as much time as I was able to every single game with the fans. Let me tell you something, nice. man. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I'll tell everybody who's listening who may not focus on this. Without fans, there is no game. Without fans, there is no league. Mm-hmm. Um, the fans are, are so important. And so I would get to the game as early as, I mean, I got there early, 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 both, on, you know, I would come early on home games. I'd drive myself on road games. I'd go with the first team bus and I would walk mm-hmm. the parking lots and visit with our fans, both the ones who traveled to road games, which as you know, Raider fans do that. And yep. also in our home stadium. And I would walk through the parking lots and I would spend as much time as I could with them pregame. And one of the fun things was, you know, they would always be inviting me over, join our barbecue, join our barbecue. And then word sort of got out that I'm a vegetarian. So then I would walk through the parking lot before the game and fans would be yelling out, Amy, we made you asparagus. Amy, what's up? <laughs> it was great. And then during the games, I would, um, you know, I'd be upstairs. I'd be in a box. I'd be working. I'd be doing, you know, any number of different things, interacting with league officials that were there or visiting team executives and team ownership but then I would find time and I would just go sit in the stands. And I'm not just talking the fancy schmancy seats. I would go sit in the third deck. I would sit in the end zone. I would sit in the first deck. I would sit in the club seats. I went through the stadium and I sat with our fans and I cherished those moments. Did you experience that black hole? <laughs> of course. I actually brought Roger Goodell to sit in the black hole once. Roger nice. Goodell enjoyed a game in the black hole. <laughs> Leslie Visser, you guys know Leslie Visser, yeah, the yeah, first yeah, woman yeah. in a locker room, and she was CBS Sports. Um, yep. She once said to me on the sideline, she was covering one of our games, and you know she was there on the sideline, and she said, let's talk about this black hole. And I said, come on, Leslie, let's go over there. And I brought Leslie over to the black hole and I introduced her to all the fans and they loved her. I brought Roger Goodell to the black hole. He watched at least a full quarter of the game, if not a quarter and a half or two quarters in the black hole. Black hole's great. Look, these fans, um, you know, they look scary and mean and terrifying. They're wonderful, Uh, wonderful, wonderful people. And, And by the way, excuse me, they're not the ones who were throwing snowballs at. You know, <laughs> Listen, they threw they they threw a lot of other stuff though, which is mainly verbal. <laughs> okay. Allegedly, <laughs> it was a lot going on in the black hole. <laughs> uh, but uh, luckily, and, and and you know we we. We won. We won quite a few of that black. In the black yeah, you did. It was. It's you a know, wonderful so, rivalry. And, you know, so they weren't being very nice to us, <laughs> but but that's the but that's the you have to experience that. And I and I think I feel sorry for the new guys that can, that didn't get this and have that experience because you know you're walking in yeah. you're walking into the Taj Mahal now, and you know it's different playing the Raiders now. But it is playing and the Raiders it, back then. You want them, you want them to be talking about your mama and all this <laughs> stuff talking about you. <laughs> and uh, I remember we had a we had a guy Patrick Chakura. He had long thin dreads. And uh, I'm walking behind him, and and it's doing this thing. It's like, who the f you think you are, Rick James? Oh <laughs> <laughs> they were crazy. They were nuts up there, man. But I, I enjoyed playing there. Uh, I like the the opening like song when they would be, when they would run out. Like I'm a I'm a big guy. I'm a lineman. And so I used to be in awe of, and I'm not a small dude, but man, it used to be so crazy to see Big Lincoln, Big yep. Mo, Mo, yep. um, uh, yeah, Lincoln, Mo, Fred Robbins, uh, uh, well, Langston uh, Walker, Langston, uh, run out there. Uh, I had to say, come on, I had to throw Langston in. He went, he's a Cal Berkeley Golden Bear. Cal so Berkeley, I, I, had to, I had to throw Langston in. <laughs> he, is, he is a Golden Bear. I like Langston. Langston's my guy. Um, and uh, who, uh, and uh, 
the smallest one was a uh, who at Barry Sims. <laughs> He maybe, was, maybe. Yeah, he was probably. You know, small. that's where that's where games are won and lost. Games and one games are for the most part won and lost at the line of scrimmage. They if you can't, put, it, it's where it's where it's where you got to dominate. I remember playing against when y'all when y'all went and got uh, Warren. I remember playing against him out there on in, on that dirt field. And I still yeah, that's right. The, the overlap. Yeah, the overlap between the um, baseball and football season and the dirt on the Did field. Did you ever get to stand? I'm pretty sure you did walking through that building. Did you ever get to stand next to the largest human I ever seen on the field, uh, Turdell Sands? I did. I did. <laughs> That's the largest. Y'all, I, I will hope y'all have a picture together somewhere. <laughs> that is the biggest human. No, Lamar, I'm a big dude. He is the biggest human I've ever seen <laughs> on a football field. <laughs> he had to be about seven foot four hundred. <laughs> I don't know about the seven foot part, but yeah, the four hundred part was real though. I'm not <laughs> I, answer, I heard, I heard, that. I heard I'm some answer. stories about that. <laughs> but, but he was at least six. He was at least six, seven, six. Yeah, eight, yeah, you're, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, high three hundreds, close to four hundred in the off season, <laughs> and uh, like man, Raiders. As much as that make that makes me think. As much as Al was a speed guy. He likes some big old dudes, too, now. Well, he, you know, what was his, two of the things he said to me all the time. And he said, one, the first one, um, he said to me from the start of my career on, and he said it to me repeatedly, and it has to do with corners. Kid, don't ever leave a team without corners. The other mm -hmm. thing he said to me all the time, and this he said publicly, so people are very familiar with this one, the quarterback must go down, and he must go down hard. And so, you know, he under, he believed you needed pass rush, you needed fierce pass rush, and conversely, when you were on offense, you needed pass protection. Yep, yeah. and boy, the Raiders had a wall. I can't, I can't tell you how many times I would say to Al when I was, when I would go into his office and I would need to tell him something or get him to sign some documents or go over some banking issue with him. And he was watching practice. Well, we called it film back then. I recognize it's not film anymore. It went from film to tape and now it's gosh knows what, but he'd be watching practice stuff and we'd be talking about the last game we played and, and problems we might've had, or we'd be talking about our upcoming opponent. And I would always start the sentence. Well, if I was defensive coordinator, and before I could get another word out, <laughs> you're not. <laughs> <laughs> how how deep did you get into the actual? I know you had a lot going on uh, 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 upstairs, but how deep did you get into the players and you know knowing their strengths and weaknesses? Oh, and, yeah, he taught you know, me so much. Per person, oh. pers personnel side, because I imagine y'all had uh, conversations that led to you being more aware of you know these guys. You know, like like I said, from a personnel side. Absolutely. Um, I had nothing to do with selecting the players, although I always gave out my opinion. In other words, I wasn't in the draft room. I wasn't part of the draft process. Um, I wasn't making trades or um, I wasn't building our roster in any way. It didn't keep me from opening my mouth when I had thoughts to share, but I wasn't involved in that process. But I did spend time with Al every single day when he was in the office. And quite often that was before practice, after practice, as I said, First we called it film, then we called it tape, mm -hmm. but he always had it on. And so there'd be times I'd be in his office and waiting. I'd have to wait. You know, he'd have me sit there and watch practice with him. And it was either, you know, we would talk about the game we just played. We would talk about the upcoming opponent. And there were things I could tell he was, he was helping me learn and, and he would test me. He would ask me things and, you know, he made sure I understood clock management and he made sure I understood matchups and there'd be things he'd ask me. And, and it's kind of cool. Like when I would make an observation that he agreed with, he would just get this little smile on his face. And that probably helped, you know, I'm pretty sure business is business, but pretty sure you had to deal with many a man, uh, you know, in these negotiations and to be able to, you know, probably surprise some people with, how much you knew about the game. Well, and you're right. Business is business, but it is the business of football. And if you look, if you work for a widget factory, 
You better understand mm-hmm. widgets. If mm-hmm. you work for a True. button factory, you better understand how to make buttons. If you work for a football organization, you better understand X's and O's. Doesn't mean you're going to be coaching, although I did offer to be defensive coordinator. Doesn't mean you're going <laughs> to yeah. be drafting. I wasn't involved in that. But you better understand your business. Well, I mean, it's funny that you say that because the game is changing. It's constantly changing. You know, you have the Washington ca- uh, commanders that are actually up for sale right now. Um, you got Lamar Jackson, who's holding out, looking for a bigger contract, and these quarterbacks are making these outrageous amounts of money. What do you think about the state of the game now? I mean, you've been out of it, uh, out of, you know, from being CEO of the Oakland Raiders for a while, but what do you think of the state of the game right now as it stands? Well, I love the game. I love the game of football. And there's going to be debate all the time about rule changes, what rules should be changed, what rules shouldn't be changed. I do agree that changes for the health and safety benefit of the players are very, very important. I understand Mm -hmm. that these rule changes, you know, are met with criticism from some, um, with glee from others. But that's the point. People love the game. They absolutely love the game. And what always fascinates me is whenever there's something that occurs and people think, well, the fans aren't going to like this, they're going to distance themselves from their team, we don't really see that happen. The, the fan avidity for the game is tremendous. And look, people have the right to decide what they want to watch, what tickets they want to buy, whether to a movie or a sporting event, what clothing they want to buy, whether it has a team logo or not. And what I know when I watch the National Football League is – People are buying the tickets, people are buying the merchandise, people are going to the games, and they love having these debates. So, um, you know, do I agree with every rule change? Not necessarily. Uh, Do I agree with every business decision? Not necessarily. But do I love the game? Yes, I do. Excellent. Well, we know that your, you know, your time is very valuable, Amy. Um, But what are you doing now? I think that's what most people want to know because – Again, it's it's Women's History Month, and you have meant a ton to the NFL. I mean, after <laughs> after we're done, we you know we're going to talk about a little bit more of, of the ladies that you've impacted. But as a American executive, sports executive, now what are you doing? Can, well, can I you. add? Can I add to that question? Because I assume what one of your answers is going to be um, concerning the big three. And when you give that answer, um, I let you know how you got involved with that because, like when I when I heard, when I heard that, I like to think that it have to have something to do with you know Q being a Raiders fan, knowing you from back you know with your time with the Raiders, and then knowing that you're, you're business savvy. But um, can you give us a little bit of how you get in, went to a whole different sport and um, um, being an executive in that? Sure. Well, what I'm doing, my primary role right now is as an analyst for CBS Sports, CBS mm-hmm. Sports Network, and I'm on a pregame show every Sunday morning, and it's the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, being on camera scares me more than anything. My first year on the show, I said to the producer before the game, I'm so scared that I think when you say we're live, I'm going to throw up all over myself, to which the producer said, oh, we'd get so many YouTube hits for that. Great. <laughs> and you know the linebacker, Bart Scott? He yes. was on the show with us the first year. Bart literally, not figuratively speaking, literally held my hand under the table. I was so scared. And then when we would come out of commercial break, he would gently put my hand back up on the desk. And then when we went to another commercial, he'd say, you're okay, you're okay. And he'd hold my hand again. And um, the reason I'm sharing that with you is, Sometimes it's fun to do what scares you the most because now I think, wait a minute, wait a minute. You guys are paying me to talk about football and you do my hair and makeup for me? How did I get so lucky? (laughs) So um, I've gone from being terrified. I'm still scared of the camera, but I absolutely love doing that. And I have been involved with the big three. Um, The big three was formed by Cube, as you noted, and his longtime business partner, Jeff Quantnitz. And when, the, um, when they first formed the Big Three, they asked me if I would be involved for a period of time to help get it up and running and, and on its feet, which I did. Um, and although I no longer have an official role or title, I remain committed to supporting them in any way that I can. Um, it's just, you know, what Cube said prompted him 
to want to form the league is something that I think will resonate with you men. He looked at these phenomenal, phenomenal NBA players who reached a certain point in their careers and then were just discarded by their teams, just Uh, discarded. And he thought, oh, no, 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 no. Number one, you still have more game in you. And number two, you shouldn't have been discarded the way that you were discarded. So, you know, he formed, he and Jeff formed this league. I was in a board position for a number of years. Now, as I said, I'm involved with supporting it in any way I can, albeit not in that role anymore. Um, But the players have all expressed to him, you've given us life again. And there are tremendous, tremendous players and the coaches, oh, first of all, Clyde Drexler is, is the, the, the commissioner, which is absolutely phenomenal. <laughs> right. um, and there are, there are, you know, Rick Barry is a coach and Gary Payton is a coach and yep. Dr. J and, and Charles Oakley. I mean, there's just great, great. And then, and then, so um, speaking of, we'll tie this into Women's History Month, uh, Clyde was a coach the first year of the Big Three. And then mm-hmm. Clyde was made commissioner. So we had to replace Clyde as a coach and we're sitting in a room and I will always remember this moment. It was cube, Jeff Quantinets, Clyde, me. And we said, we need to replace you, Clyde. We need another coach. So I said, what about Nancy Lieberman? Mm -hmm. And not one of those men balked at the idea of hiring a woman as a coach. So there's Nancy and she's one of the coaches in the big three. And the next year when Cuban Jeff decided to expand the league, we needed another coach. We hired Lisa Leslie. So two of our coaches are Nancy and Lisa. And let me tell you something. There is not one man with whom I interacted in the big three, not one coach, not one player who gave a second of thought to the fact that these coaches were women. And in fact, each of them, in their first year, were voted coach of the year by all the players and all the coaches. Nancy comes in year one, wins the championship, coach of the year, yep. and we're at a press conference at the cha- after the championship game. And the players are constantly being asked, what's it like playing for a woman? What's it like playing for a woman? Finally, one of our players grabbed the microphone and said, stop asking us what it's like playing for a woman mm. coach. You are thinking about that. We don't think about that. We think of her as our coach, period. And it was such a powerful, powerful moment. So, you know, Cube and Jeff in forming this league are leading by example. It is a minority-owned business, uh, certified as such. Women are coaches. And I'll always remember George Gervin looking at Lisa and Nancy thinking, I got to take coaching lessons from you two. (laughs) I think he said that aloud. (laughs) Well, Amy, before you go, I just got this last question. How did you get the the, uh, nickname Princess of Darkness? Oh, I'm so glad you asked me that because I (laughs) will forever, forever, forever cherish my nickname. Uh, Mike Silver, who at the time was with Sports Illustrated. Mike Silver. (laughs) He was with Sports Illustrated. And he wrote an, he wrote a profile on me. I don't know what you call it, a piece, a profile. He wrote whatever you call it. He wrote a profile. And in it, He quoted anonymous sources, wouldn't go on the record, but he noted that they were league um, and team, other other team, but league and team executives um, talking about me. And a couple of them said to Mike, behind her back, we refer to her as the princess of darkness. And it was very, (laughs) very clear from the piece that that was not intended as a compliment. I kind of liked it. And Raider fans liked it. And Raider yeah. fans liked it. And I liked it. And we just said, you know what? That's a heck of a nickname. And I embraced it. And I'm telling you, men, I will be the princess of darkness forever. And the next time we talk, <laughs> you guys better be very scared of me. Very scared. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm hoping that you get on a, uh, you know, on a remix with Cube. And, you know, it's Ice Cube and the princess of darkness. Don't, don't think do. I haven't <laughs> suggested it. Do not think I haven't suggested it. And then do not think that when I did suggest it, those in his very inner circle said, aim, try not to ruin his career, would you? <laughs> 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 all right well amy we thank you for joining the 100 sanford podcast we really really do it's like we said it's women's history month and we try to pay homage when we can but there was no other name that we could think of that we wanted to bring on that meant so much to the game of football and and to the transition of women in power uh being in power positions in this league so we thank you once again and um if there's anything else you want to say to our fans we'd love for you to and we just well, enjoyed you being here 
I do. I want to thank you and tell your fans, of which you have many, how truly, truly honored I am to join you on this terrific podcast. It's been an honor. It's been a pleasure. It's been a whole lot of fun. And I really appreciate you inviting me on. And I appreciate what you're doing to advance the concepts we discussed, which is hiring people without regard to race or gender or ethnicity or any individuality, which has no bearing whatsoever on whether they do a job. And when that happens and those things are no longer newsworthy, um, that'll be a moment to celebrate. Amen. Thank you. Thank Believe you, it Amy. That. We appreciate you. <laughs> appreciate you. Thanks, man. Thank you, Amy. All right now. Bye-bye. Foss, that was Amy Trask, man. That was that was a, um, you know, there's sometimes you do an interview and there's sometimes you talk with different people and it resonates with you and it just means a lot. Um, right. You know, I've had, we, you know, last year we did Traley Hill, um, Keely Ringo's mom, and she came mm-hmm. on. Uh, and we talked about breast cancer awareness. And for the fans that do know and know of her, her history, you know, dealing with breast cancer. And I think she's still dealing with it right now. So prayers out to her. Um, It meant so much. But when you have a a woman like Amy come on, who's meant that much to the game, I mean, the Princess of Darkness label, but working side by side with one of the greatest owners in the history of sports, Al Davis. And I think a lot of people really don't even know his history. I'd love to one day get into his history as deep as it can possibly get. But Mm -hmm. what she meant in terms of people of uh, uh, w- women transitioning into the game, you know, the first officials, the, uh, you know, women uh, executives, scouts, everything. It, mean- it means a lot. So I thought it was an excellent interview. Yeah, it was great. I'm glad she um, decided to come on. Uh, like I said, she, she didn't have to, you know, she has a, a very big name in the business and um, she took some time out to kick it with us at 100 Sanford, and um, I am appreciative. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, You know, and I'd love to bring her back on to to talk maybe next year, you know, bring on maybe a panel of ladies that can come on and talk during the History Month and just talk about the transitioning of the game. I think that'd be uh, awesome. And, and again, we talk about those that have now entered the game. When you start talking about uh, female coaches with Catherine uh, Smith, you know, Buffalo Bills, quality, I think quality control special teams coach, the first women coach that came into the NFL. Sarah Thomas, who's an official now. I mean, you see her all the time. I swear, she's like a clone because I, every game I watch, she's on. I have no idea how my many girl, times they get girl, around. My girl, Lori Locus. Yeah. Um, Lo, Lo just got another job, I think. Uh, she was with the Bucks. Who did Lo, who did Lo just sign with? Lo just signed with someone else. But um, she's been coaching D. She coached, helped coach D line down there in Tampa. Um, nice, nice. Got a got a Super Bowl ring with them, you know. So I don't, yeah. I don't know. Not many women have a Super Bowl rings as coaches, you know. So yeah. this, and the game is going in that direction, you know. We just got to keep advancing. It's going, you know. And one of the questions I would have loved to have asked her, and I think we might have to do this offline or something like that, is. Will there ever be a female football player actually on the field? Outside of kickers, I know everybody always says, well, you know, they can kick, something like that. What are your thoughts? you think there, there will ever be a woman that actually graces the locker room, that actually is on that field, part of the 53-man roster? Here, here's the thing. The, pro- the, problem is, the problem is the disparity in size. You know, size and mass, you mm-hmm. know, it, it, you know, it doesn't – I think it would be dangerous, you know, like they, you know, women just, just, just by nature don't have the same mass definitely and don't have um, the same muscle mass as men. And like these, these men are getting bigger and faster and stronger every single day. Right. And it's right. it's cra- like they, they're <laughs> flying around like, they like there's not a, there's 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 not a there's not a woman on this earth that can stand up to uh, Jordan Davis running a four seven <laughs> right right right, at her. right you know what right. I mean? she can she can be three hundred pounds it don't it wouldn't it wouldn't be pretty you know what I mean so I don't think it would I don't think it would ever happen in that regard but it doesn't mm-hmm. it doesn't need to happen everything else is split up 
you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so, you know, we got women's league. We got women's football leagues, and, you know, they play good football. They play the same ball as uh, me, and I've, I've met I've met a couple of the D.C. Divas before, you know, mm-hmm. at the um, at the um, Combine when um, like the NFL PA had some, you know, some stuff set up for the guys and they're that and I think the the that that league, you know, had some stuff going on up there in Indianapolis that um that that week too. And um I met a couple of the women that played for D C Divas and, you know, they just love the game just like everyone else. And mm-hmm. you know, they wanted to play and they getting the chance to play. And um it's good. Yeah. It's and good. I think I, one of the things that was also awesome that what Amy brought to our listener is a lot of times females are looked at as oh they're just cheerleaders you know they like the game they enjoy the game they like the pageantry but no you can have an expertise as well i mean when we talk about the ladies game progressing like the like the dc divas and things like that understanding the game knowing the game the ins and outs of the game the passion of the game how it impacts you on the business side also from you know on the football side on the field side I think that's what I loved about that interview because a lot of times people will just assume, like she said, you know, I'm, I'm up in the ivory tower, so to speak, handling numbers, but no, I can break down a defense too if I had to, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and understanding what we need as, a, as an organization. So I thought that was pretty awesome. Right. Some, of the, some of the better fans of the game I know are women. You know, right. because, you know, men can be a bit obnoxious and, <laughs> and be loud and wrong. You know, right. I'll tell you what, because the nature of the sport and the men that enjoy the sport, mm-hmm. women are more calculated with mm-hmm. their with their uh, football analysis, and they right. want to be right. right. You know, they don't want they don't <laughs> they don't they don't want to they don't want to be the stereotype uh, of a, a woman that don't know football. So when the, these these women football fans, you know, they know their stuff. You know what I mean, and so I, I enjoy talking um, football with with the likes of those, those women. You know, you got you know got the gridiron girls, gridiron gals. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Rita and uh, and Chels. You know, I always enjoy talking football with those those lo- those ladies. You know, online and whatnot, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's all it's all good. You know, the game is changing. Facts, facts. Well, it's almost time to get up out of here, man. Um, yes, sir. It was a great interview, like I said, and what we already mentioned. Next, uh, we well, we're off next week, but in two weeks we are going to come back. We're going to do our uh, pre-draft analysis, pre-draft mm-hmm. um, interview with Emery Hunt. He's a CBS yep. analyst that does the draft, breaks it down very well, has his own. Um, heck, he he evaluates over a thousand people, man. I, I'm actually a subscriber to what he's got. It's impressive. And it's very, yeah, that's very impressive, man. To watch that much film and to break down each guy, and it's not one of these, you know, well, I'm just going to give this guy this label because I see he's six five and you know three hundred pounds, and I'm just going to no. He actually watches film on all these guys, so we're going to have that breakdown along with uh, preparing for, you know, like we said, G Day. So uh, we'll be able to have some more. Detailed information. Hopefully, Graham will be here as well with his analysis, and uh, we'll get ready for G Day. And, and actually, some pads popping, man, because it's getting close. It gets closer every week. It gets a little bit closer, so um, can't wait for that. But um, anything else to say before we get up out of here, man? Nothing else, man. Go dogs! As always, go dogs. See you at one hundred Sanford. Yes, sir. We are out. Thank you for listening to the 100 Sanford Podcast. Tune in weekly to hear fresh content from the 100 Sanford Podcast every Thursday, but also with some pop-up shows every now and then as news breaks. You can also follow the content on our website, www.100sanfordpodcast.com, and email us at dogs at 100sanfordpodcast.com. Lastly, reach out to us on social media streams. For Twitter, it's at 100 Sanford, but on IG, TikTok, Facebook, and other accounts, it's 100 Sanford Podcast. All right, folks, that's it. And as usual, see you at 100 Sanford.